the good thing that all the living organisms share the same genetic system is that uh, that means if we want to know the function of a particular gene, if we want to know the function of a particular human gene, we don't need to study that human gene directly. We can study genes, we can study similar genes of that human gene in other organism, and that knowledge can help us to understand the similar human gene. And uh, uh, that's the basis of why we can use these model genetic organisms to help us to understand the gene function, to understand uh, the relationship between genotype and the phenotype. So model genetic organisms are organisms with characteristics that make them very, very useful for genetic uh, analysis. Um, we can see that model or genetic organisms shape the current landscape of genetic studies. Without help of these uh, model organisms, we wouldn't be able to know so much about our own genes. So uh, now let's look at some of the examples of these uh, model organisms. And the first one is um, E. coli, which is a, a prokaryote a bacterium. Um, it's uh, probably the earliest genetic model organism that's been used in studies, and many labs still uh, use uh, E. coli for many uh, lab trials. And uh, then we have the simplest eukaryotic model organism, um, which is uh, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or the uh, baker's yeast. And uh, you probably, by looking at this cell here and looking at yourself, you probably will find absolutely no similarity between us and these little guys here. But quite dramatically, we share 70% of the genes. So 70% of human genes can actually find homologs uh, in yeast. And uh, studies in yeast have revealed many of the fundamental regulations of many processes uh, in the cell, such as DNA replication, transcription, cell division, and so on. And uh, um, we also have these two, uh, what we call the star uh, animal uh, model organisms, the uh, nematode, uh, C. elegans, and also uh, fruit flies. And uh, um, these animals, they have contributed to uh, many of our current understanding of, of development and uh, even uh, human disease and aging and uh, many other uh, aspects of life. And uh, um, as we will be discussing in later uh, chapters, you can see that uh, fruit of flies has really been a great contributor to our understanding of principles of genetics and our understanding of how a uh, development process is being regulated by genes. Uh, and finally, uh, this little guy here is called Arabidopsis thaliana. This is my favorite plant. And uh, uh, this is also the organism that I work every day in my own lab. So it's a, a model plant. Um, although this is a wild species, um, but they uh, share many homologs with crops. And because its genome is much, much smaller than most uh, than crops, so it's much easier to work with this guy than to directly working on uh, maize or wheat. And we can use knowledge that we learned from model organism and to apply them to uh, improve crops. Um, finally, um, uh, Masmasculus here, uh, this is, um, these are mice. So, um, these are the model organism for uh, mammals. And uh, before any of the genetic studies, um, if we are working on biomedical uh, problems, uh, we probably uh, want to uh, develop drugs that target certain gene function. And uh, all of this needs to be tested, of course, uh, in the mice first. So uh, they actually did contribute a lot to uh, biomedical studies. And uh, um, finally, I want to summarize some of the common characteristics of uh, model organisms. After all, there are 
tens of thousands of different species on the Earth. And uh, how are these animals, how are these organisms so different from others, so unique, uh, that making them the stars in the lab of genetic studies? And uh, the reason are first, um, these animals, uh, these organisms, they should have short generation time. Um, uh, if you are uh, working on genetics, you probably need to do a lot of crosses and you want to analyze the offspring of those crosses. And if the generation time is too long, that means it will take too long to do genetic analysis. So we want a short generation time, ideally just the weeks and, or, and months. Uh, second, they need to be able to produce a numerous progeny because when we uh, analyze offspring, as we will be discussing in the next chapter, um, chance play an important role in the outcome of genetic crosses. And only when we have numerous progeny, we'll be able to apply statistical methods to analyze the progeny. So uh, we want an organism that are able to produce numerous progeny in every single cross. And the third, we uh, want this organism to have the ability to carry on to control the genetic crosses. Because as you will see later on, genetic crosses really is the basis, is the foundation of every uh, genetic studies. And then um, these animals, uh, these organisms should be, able, should be able to be reared in a laboratory environment. And uh, it shouldn't be very costly to um, cultivate these organisms uh, in the lab. And uh, also, um, there should be an availability of numerous genetic variants because if we look at individuals of the same genotype, then all of these individuals in this population will have the same phenotype. Uh, when there is no genetic variation among individuals in the population, there will be no phenotypic variation. And without that phenotypic variation, we wouldn't be able to figure out which genes controls which phenotype. So having different genetic variants really are the keys to genetic studies. And finally, there should be an accumulated body of knowledge about their genetic system. Um, that is, we should be able to have the knowledge of their uh, chromosome compositions, uh, like how many chromosomes uh, in, this, uh, in this organism in one cell. Ideally, in this case, we should be able to have the genome sequence of these uh, individuals. And uh, uh, this knowledge will certainly uh, facilitate their usage in genetic studies. And here I want to show you an example of what we can learn from a model organism to really give you an idea of how useful model organisms are. The example I want to show you is the study of genes that control aging. And so longevity, the quest for longevity, really have a very, very long history in many different societies uh, in the world. So. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, we as humans, uh, we have never stopped our quest for a healthier and uh, uh, longer life. For a geneticist, the question can be transformed as, uh, are there genes to control aging? And the answer is actually yes. Um, one of the pathways uh, that controls aging is through the nutrient sensitive signaling network. So this is a pathway uh, that controls aging, the, the rate of aging in many different species. So it's a very, very conserved pathway. So the first studies were actually uh, carried out in these animals. These, the, there are um, studies in worms and the fruit flies. They all show that nutrient sensing are key to the regulation of aging rate. And uh, um, this process is carried out uh, by uh, these genes, especially a receptor here. Uh, and uh, uh, this gene here 
it not only controls the aging rate in worms, a similar gene also controls aging in fruit fly, and uh, dramatically, the same gene also controls aging in um, mouse. And recently, uh, studies have shown that a similar mechanism also uh, happened in human cells. So these studies here really uh, demonstrate that um, this is a very conserved pathway. It happens uh, in all the organisms, uh, including nematodes, insects, and mice. And uh, uh, studies also suggest that this network also influences aging rate in humans. So as we can see, if we want to study the aging of human, it's going to be uh, very difficult because it's very difficult to find objects of study. And also, uh, a human generation is like 60 to 100 years. So the generation time is... Uh, very long, it's very difficult to follow in many generations to carry out the study. However, for worms and the fruit flies, since their generation time is only weeks, so we can follow them generation after generation, which making them ideal models to study aging. And uh, since these genes, they are all conserved, that means homologous genes are found in worms and the flies and also mammals and also us. So that means the knowledge we learn from these simple organisms can be readily applied to studies of human. So finally, to summarize this part, so today uh, we discussed the importance of genetics, by discussing genes are fundamental to who and what we are, I showed you a few examples of how genes influence our life, influence agriculture, influence biomedical studies, and influence our understanding to ourselves. And also, uh, we discussed that genetics is one of the most rapidly advancing fields uh, in science, and new discoveries are being published every month. And also, on these new findings and applications of genetics, they will have very significant economic and ethical implications. All right, um, we'll stop here and see you next time.